The movie begins in southwest Minnesota, 1880. A haunting scene unfolds where a powerless woman named Mary Jane, believed to be a witch, meets a gruesome fate at the hands of the vengeful local. The poor woman is dragged to a tree stump and held down with force. She screams and thrashes for help, but to no avail. She looks at the pastor standing over her, and threatens that he too would face the same fate as her, so he shouldn't be so happy. She bellows her parting words, and the ruthless executioner raises his menacing saw. Suddenly the pastor motions to the masked man, and he ruthlessly takes Mary Jane's life with an axe, resulting in a chilling display of blood and violence. Everyone leaves, but the pastor stays back with a somber expression, and silently picks up the woman's necklace, holding it for dear life. The pastor looks like he had some kind of emotional attachment with the executed witch. Fast forward to the present day. We see a visibly troubled man named Louis driving back to his secluded home in the desolate wilderness of Minnesota. He arrives at a small house and steps out of his car. He enters the house, worn out from his journey. The house is empty and gives off strange dark vibes. Louis comes in and takes off the cross from the wall, putting it inside the drawer. The day goes by, with the poor man drinking all alone. The day slowly turns into night, and he finally lies down on the bed, seeking solace, only to be disturbed with a chilling nightmare where he sees his wife's bleeding corpse. The next morning, he is awakened by a sudden knock at the door. Louis sighs and wakes up to open the door. There is an old but rather active man named Emery standing outside. He introduces himself as a neighbor, and informs Louis that Gunderson, who turns out to be Louis's acquaintance, mentioned he would be there and asked Emery to check on him. Louis assures Emery that he's fine, and explains that he chose this isolated area not specifically for a vacation, but rather to escape the city and enjoy some fishing. Emery, after hearing about fishing, gets all tingly and excited. He ecstatically points out that there are two lakes nearby for fishing, Indian Lake and Round Lake. He recommends Round Lake, since he goes there often, and the place is perfect for fishing. Emery warns Louis about local teenagers drinking in the area, but advises him to simply ask them to leave if they become bothersome. Louis expresses his gratitude for the information, and Emery bids him farewell after telling him to enjoy himself and pointing out his house for him if he needs anything. A little later in the afternoon, Louis sets off for his fishing trip. He drives the straight empty road while observing the beautiful scenery around him. While driving, he notices a sign for Loon Lake and decides to stop and film the fields. While he films, a slow wind blows, creating an eerie silence. Louis becomes aware of a presence behind him, and scans the surroundings, feeling a sense of something passing through the air. As he continues walking, he discovers an old grave nestled among the trees on the side of the field. Curiosity peaked. Louis stops near the grave of Mary Jane, and reads the words inscribed on her tombstone, the same words she uttered before her execution. A string of words that remind one of the mortality of the entire universe. Everything ultimately comes to an end. He moves on and continues to film. Engrossed, he hears the sounds of birds, which divert his attention. Oblivious to his surroundings, he unknowingly steps on the grave, when suddenly he hears a rustling sound. He moves closer to investigate the source of the noise. Suddenly, he spots the body of a loon, fallen on the ground. Startled and terrified, he scans the field, searching for any sign of someone who could have shot the bird. Finding nothing, fear overwhelms him, and he flees from the field, running for his life. The scene cuts to a bar, where we see poor terrified Louis drinking away his sorrows. He sits around two other men, one of whom is the bartender, who are probably in their fifties. They recognize him as someone new, and try to strike up a conversation. Louis reveals that he recently arrived, and is on a break from his job as a sports writer for the Tribune in the city. The old men ask Louis if he has gone fishing yet. Louis responds, mentioning his visit to Loon Lake, where he didn't catch anything, but stumbled upon the old cemetery. They are surprised, and a bit wary, after hearing about Loon Lake, as they haven't been to that cemetery in a long time. The bar's female employee adds that she went there during the summer. The conversation takes a light-hearted turn as they all joke about not doing much there. The men inform Louis that only one person, Jeb, regularly tends to the graves, keeping the headstones clean and deterring local kids from causing trouble. Jordy, the customer, shares more information, revealing that there used to be a church at the cemetery, but it burned down many years ago, a fact that surprises the bartender. Louis chimes in, mentioning the numerous headstones he saw, and his impression that many people lost their lives at a young age. The bartender happens to be aware of the famous story of Loon Lake, and asks Louis if he knows the story behind it. Louis prompts him to continue, curious to learn more. The bartender and Jordy explain that it is believed that a witch is buried in the cemetery. According to local lore, she was beheaded, but it took three strikes before her head separated from her body. They buried the axe along with her. The townspeople also accused her of cursing their crops and performing strange rituals using small b****s as sacrifice. The story remains uncertain, shrouded in mystery and speculation. Louis finds himself engrossed in conversation with the bartender. The bartender recounts the tragic demise of a man who supposedly succumbed to carbon monoxide poisoning. However, rumors persist that his car was faulty, hinting at something more sinister. Another tale follows, involving a skilled swimmer who mysteriously drowned. The circumstances surrounding these casualties raise questions and send shivers down Louis's spine. As the stories unfold, they conclude their conversation by mentioning that these types of ghost stories are often used to scare gullible children. 
the bartender playfully warns Louis not to be careless during his own adventures, emphasizing the haunting nature of their town's legends. Louis responds with a nervous chuckle, assuring the bartender that he will take heat. The scene transitions to the exterior of the bar, revealing a lively night scene on the dimly lit streets. Inside, the bar's female worker, named Gracie, asks Louis if he plans to grab a bite to eat across the street. Louis agrees, and decides to accompany Gracie. Just as they prepare to leave, the door swings open, and Emery boisterously announces his arrival, warmly greeting both Louis and Gracie. The men exchange pleasantries, while Emery inquires if Louis found the round lake. The bartender chimes in, saying that Louis found Loon Lake. Louis responds by saying that he actually ended up getting lost in Loon Lake. Afterwards, they bid their farewells, and Louis and Gracie decide to leave. They walk out and, side by side, make their way towards a nearby cafe. After getting seated, they order their drinks and engage in a lively conversation. Gracie shares that she works part-time at the bar, but is actually a nurse at the Akaboji Hospital, located just 20 minutes away, across the border in Iowa. A brief moment of silence follows, and Gracie sees the wedding ring on Louis. She broaches the topic of Louis's marital status. His expression grows somber as he reveals that he was once married, but tragically lost his wife in a car accident. Gracie's heart sinks, and she sympathizes with him, mentioning her own failed marriage, where she found out about her husband cheating on her. They share a moment of shared loss and vulnerability. As their conversation flows, supper arrives, and they indulge in the delectable dishes before them. Gracie lifts her glass, toasting to the ones they love, acknowledging the pain and heartbreak that often accompanies deep connections. Louis joins her in raising his glass, their eyes meeting briefly in understanding. Their cheers serve as a testament to resilience and the ability to find joy amidst tragedy. Gracie then welcomes Louis to the round lake, and they cheer up. After a satisfying meal, they step out of the cafe, and Gracie notices Louis's evident intoxication. Concerned for his well-being, she offers to give him a ride home. She suggests that her sister, who resides nearby, could come pick her up afterward. Despite his protests, Louis eventually concedes. Gracie takes the wheel of Louis's car, and they travel along a dark and eerie road, surrounded by a horror-inducing atmosphere. Suddenly Gracie brings up the local witch lore. She admits that she doesn't personally believe in ghosts, but she still avoids walking around Loon Lake alone. Gracie also shares what she knows about the tale of how Mary Jane, a supposed witch, passed away a long time ago. Turns out, it was Emery's great-grandfather, a pastor, who was involved in her execution, but Emery prefers not to discuss it. Louis expresses surprise. She gives him another shock by mentioning a tale whereby Emery's great-grandfather was giving the final rites to Mary Jane's cemetery, when suddenly, the air around him started to get creepy and the clouds rumbled. Nevertheless, he still completed the rites and went back to the church. That night, in the church, things started going out of hand. The pastor knew it was not normal, and it must be the work of some evil spirit, so he prayed. Mid-prayer, suddenly he saw the ghost of Mary Jane sitting in front of him. Despite his attempts to rid the holy church of the evil spirit, he failed, and thus Mary Jane ended up setting fire and burning the church down to ashes. What's more shocking is that the pastor still survived, and passed away in agony three days later, just like how the evil spirit predicted he would. Louis gets the chills after hearing this haunted tale, and tells Gracie that the village folk believe in some hardcore bullshit. Soon they pull up to his house and Louis invites the woman in to use the house phone after finding that there is no reception outside. As they walk inside, he starts to get creepy chills, feeling as though someone is following them. He stops and inspects his surroundings, but upon finding nothing, they continue inside. Once they are safely inside, Gracie goes to talk to her sister on the phone, urging her to come and pick her up. Meanwhile, Louis sees the lamp move and an eerie presence behind him. He quickly turns on the lamp and looks back, but apart from a sudden whoosh of the wind and shadows of the night, he does not catch anything in particular. Gracie returns to the hall, and the two engage in a conversation about life in the cities. Gracie shares her desire to go there, expressing her fascination with the opportunities and experiences it offers. As they talk, Louis begins to feel drowsy, and eventually drifts off to sleep. In his slumber, Louis has a vivid dream. He sees his late wife holding a baby, their faces beaming with joy amidst a cornfield. But suddenly, the image twists, and he sees his wife lying on the road, covered in blood. The jarring sight startles Louis and he awakens abruptly. Gracie is by his side, explaining that she didn't wake him, as he looked peaceful in his sleep. With a sense of melancholy, Louis bids her farewell as her sister arrives to pick her up. Gracie kindly offers him her contact number, in case he ever needs it. Louis expresses his gratitude, accepting the gesture, and they part ways. As Louis watches Gracie leave, a mix of emotions washes over him. He appreciates the brief connection they shared, and the respite it brought from his solitude. That night, Louis has a peculiar dream. In his dream, he observes a woman diligently cleaning a church. As she completes her task, a pastor enters the scene, and they engage in a light-hearted conversation, exchanging cheerful words. However, as the encounter progresses, Louis senses a shift in the atmosphere. The pastor's demeanor changes, and he begins to behave inappropriately towards the woman, whose identity is revealed to be Mary Jane. Unsettled by the pastor's actions, she becomes increasingly uncomfortable. 
The situation takes a distressing turn when the pastor forcefully grabs hold of her necklace, commenting on her beauty in an unsettling manner. The discomfort intensifies, and Mary Jane, summoning her inner strength, musters the courage to confront the situation. With a swift motion, she slaps the old man, denouncing him as a devil disguised in God's cloth. Overwhelmed with a mixture of anger and fear, she flees from his presence, seeking refuge from the disturbing encounter. The scene transitions, and Mary Jane finds herself in the midst of a tranquil forest, engaging in a peculiar yet seemingly harmless ritual. With loon feathers in hand, she performs her ritual, her intentions focused on the revitalization of the land, which has suffered from a near-barren state. Her prayer echoes, urging the spirit of the wind to breathe life back into the earth. However, the serenity is abruptly shattered when a group of men, led by the pastor, intrude upon the scene. Their arrival is disruptive and their intentions ominous. They accuse Mary Jane of witchcraft, using it as justification to forcefully seize her. The pastor says that the woman has sold her soul to the devil. In the name of their misguided beliefs, they subject her to unimaginable torment, pressuring her relentlessly to confess to crimes she adamantly denies. Mary Jane's voice resonates with desperation as she pleads her innocence, her words falling upon deaf ears. Despite her cries, the pastor remains steadfast in his conviction, turning a blind eye to the truth that she is an innocent victim of their misguided fear and prejudice. The intensity of the moment is heightened as Mary Jane endures the harrowing ordeal, held captive and subjected to a cruel interrogation. The pastor asks the men to search for the devil's mark, despite their sudden change of heart that she might be innocent. She calls Pastor Jansen a devil, and tells him that she would definitely remember his devil's hand. Startled by the piercing shrieks in his dream, Louis abruptly awakens from his slumber. His heart pounds with a mixture of confusion and unease as he senses an inexplicable presence lingering in the room. Determined to uncover the source of this strange energy, he cautiously rises from his bed and begins to explore his surroundings. Moving with trepidation, Louis's gaze catches sight of a faint glow emanating from outside his window. Intrigued and apprehensive, he follows the source of light, his steps guided by curiosity. As he ventures into the darkness, the beam of the flashlight dances amidst the swaying cornfield, leading him further into the unknown. Yet, as he enters the cornfield, he is met with the sound of faint, mischievous laughter. Realizing that this may be nothing more than a prank, Louis's frustration builds, and he raises his voice, reprimanding the unseen culprits for their juvenile antics. However, his fervent calls fall on deaf ears as the laughter suddenly vanishes. Growing weary of the game, Louis begrudgingly retreats, convinced that the pranksters have vanished into the night. He is unaware of the ghost of a woman that peeks at him from inside his home. Louis eventually retreats to his bedroom, seeking solace within the familiar confines of his bed. Oblivious to the presence lurking beneath, he settles in, unwittingly sharing his space with a spectral visitor. The enigmatic spirit, hidden beneath his bed, bides its time, its intentions and purpose concealed in the ethereal veil that separates the living from the realm of the departed. The following morning, Louis awakens to a chilling sight outside his home, an unsettling display that further disturbs his already troubled mind. A lifeless loon, brutally slaughtered and grotesquely nailed to a nearby tree, meets his disbelieving gaze. A shiver courses through his body as he grapples with the macabre symbolism of this ominous occurrence. Disturbed with the happenings, he takes refuge in Emery's company. He confides in him about the happenings, and he gives him courage by motivating him and believing in him. Louis tells Emery about his wife, and how she passed away in a car accident when she was just about to give birth. Emery's heart breaks for the poor man, and he comforts him by saying motivating words to cheer him up. He tells him that he can always come talk to him whenever he is troubled. As the men share a meaningful conversation about the complexities of life, their bond strengthens, providing a brief respite from the weight of their respective burden. In a poignant farewell, they part ways, knowing that their connection, forged through understanding and support, will remain steadfast. That afternoon, while Louis is driving, he suddenly sees a strange presence in a cornfield on the way. Stopping his car, he quickly comes down and follows the figure, but sees nothing. Suddenly he hears a baby cry, and comes face to face with his deceased wife, with a baby in her arms. They vanish as soon as they appear. And poor Louis is left alone to search and scramble through the vast field with no sense of direction. Suddenly thunder rumbles, and it starts to rain. Louis runs around, and finally comes out of the field into the forest. He runs through the trees and grass, and finally reaches his home in the dense rain. Back at home, he goes to take a shower and clean up. As he finishes, the lights suddenly go out. He once again feels the strange eerie feeling of someone following him, and keeps getting creeped out. Soon, he starts hearing the creaking of wood, and follows it to the second floor. He charges into the room with a shriek, only to find out that one of the chairs is making this noise. But his relief is short-lived, when he suddenly looks up and sees a cloaked person standing behind him in the mirror. He quickly turns around to find no one there. The poor man is terrified. Suddenly he hears knocks on the door, and slowly goes out to find Gracie there. Finally, the man is pulled out of the horrifying encounter with her arrival. She comes in with food in hand for Louis. He keeps asking if she saw any woman going out. The woman gets concerned, and comforts him by saying that there was no one. He tells her how he came across the grave of Mary Jane, so he is afraid that it might be her spirit that is following him. The woman comforts him by saying that it is nothing but a story, so he can rest assured. Afterwards, they have their dinner, 
and talk about their respective lives. Louis tells her about his deceased wife and how they loved each other. She asks why he chose to come here for the holiday. It turns out the poor man has no family. They talk, and he says that after God took the only thing he loved in the world, he lost his faith. With his wife, his faith also vanished. Gracie says that if that's the case then, and he does not have faith in God, then he shouldn't believe in ghosts either. So there is nothing for him to be afraid of, and no ghosts to disturb him. Soon after, they drift off to sleep, and Louis sees all the strange happenings in his dream again, from the deceased loon to the cornfield. Suddenly the view changes, and we see Pastor Jansen with his wife, who accuses him of not being as faithful as before. Suddenly, the man gets angry and tells his wife that he no longer believes in God. He accuses God of making his son go mad and then take his own. After saying this, he leaves the house and goes out into the woods where he comes across Mary Jane performing a ritual. The pastor, consumed by his dark beliefs, accuses the woman of being the cause of the community's hardships, blaming her for the drought and misfortune that have befallen them. Undeterred by the accusations, Mary Jane meets his gaze and lets out a gentle laugh, recognizing the irony in his words. She calmly suggests that perhaps it is the pastor himself who remains unaware of the darkness within his own heart. In a surprising turn of events, an unexpected camaraderie emerges between the two seemingly opposing figures. Strangely enough, the corrupt pastor joins Mary Jane and performs the enigmatic ritual together. As they throw in a slaughtered loon into the crackling fire, the atmosphere turns ugly. The two suddenly embrace intimately and share a sinful moment together. Soon the pastor comes to his senses and pushes the woman away. He accuses her of bewitching him, and says that he would take his revenge, and the revenge for his son, whom the woman had also bewitched. The witch, Mary Jane, warns him that he would no longer have any peace should he ever decide to turn against her. The pastor, terrified of his sinful acts, runs away. Suddenly Mary Jane turns around and calls Louis, who seems to be standing on the side. He suddenly starts to awaken from his nightmare, and finds himself on the sofa in his house, but Gracie does not seem to be there. He goes out to find her, and sees a veiled woman standing at the door. She slowly drops the veil, and he finds out that she is Ashley, his deceased wife. Suddenly the woman attacks him, and he holds her neck, trying to protect himself. He hears shrieks and starts awake from the fight, to find himself choking poor Gracie, who gets terrified and runs away. Louis, now extremely disturbed, takes out his phone to watch the recordings he made that day at Loon Lake Cemetery. He finds a woman walking in the woods. Terrified, he replays it, but this time it's nothing. Right that moment, Emery enters, asking if everything is okay. He shows the recording to Emery, and he finds everything alright with the video. Extremely distressed, he confesses to Emery that the witch at Loon Lake is after him. Emery then tells him that he has been fed nonsense by the people at the bar. He apologetically confesses to the wrong deed of his great-great-grandfather, who accused and slaughtered a poor woman in the name of witchcraft. The scene turns back to the past, and we see a heartbroken Pastor Jansen crying in the church, saying that despite his sacrifice for the Lord, the situation has not improved. He then decides to burn the church and urges God to stop it, if he is listening. Back to the present day. Emery tells this story to Louis and tells him that all the stories are wrong and it wasn't Mary Jane who slayed the pastor, but rather he himself. Louis finally calms down and decides to rest. That afternoon he goes out and is attacked by Gracie's brother who accuses him of attacking his sister. He gets hit and passes out. In his dream, he finds himself in the forest again and comes across Mary Jane, who is performing a ritual with loon blood. She paints her body with it and turns around to paint Louis's face with the animal blood too. The latter gets terrified and runs away from the terrifying woman. On the way, he finds his deceased wife's body and bends down, crying over it. Suddenly, she awakens and tells the poor man that she can save him, taking him back to Mary Jane's grave. She shows him a transcription behind the tombstone that tells the poor man how to undo the curse. He has to use an axe and remove the curse with a single swing. Louis finally comes back to his senses and awakens on the road where Gracie's brother left him. He gets up and runs to the storage room to get an axe. Coming out with the axe, he calls out to Mary Jane to come after him. He is ready, but no one comes. Suddenly he hears a door banging, and he runs to his house and turns on the light, but no one is there. He goes inside, picks up his late wife's photo, and asks her to tell him the light. Right at that moment, the cross necklace drops down onto the table. He grabs it and goes back out, waiting for Mary Jane with the axe. After a while, he drifts off to sleep. When he wakes up, it's already light, and the third day has passed. Turns out it was all fake stories after all. The man packs his stuff to go back to the city. He goes to bid farewell to Emery, and takes his car, but on the way, he sees a spirit, which makes him look back and swerve the car down the road. The poor man meets an accident. All bloody, Louis looks out of the windshield, and sees Mary Jane approaching him with a menacing look on her face. The man shrieks and starts awake, to find himself back outside his home with the axe in hand. Now he believes more than ever in the existence of the curse. He finds someone moving inside, and goes in to find Mary Jane moving around. He attacks the witch with the axe, but she vanishes and reappears behind him. He follows the witch outside, and finally lands a blow on her. The woman vanishes, and only a strange necklace covered in blood is left behind. Angry and seething, Louis grabs the necklace and goes to Emery's house. He tells him that it is not all fake, and that Mary Jane's spirit exists. 
He gives Emery the necklace and decides to go away from the town. Emery opens his hand to find a crossed necklace and wonders why Louis is so frustrated. Louis speeds his car out of the town but sees a woman midway. Just like his dream, he swerves his car and falls to his doom. In his last moments, the poor man sees the spirit of his wife holding out her hand. Emery finally believes in the stories of the witch and goes to her grave with the necklace. The movie ends with Emery putting the necklace over her tombstone and saying that Louis was a good man.